Today we have a little bit of a different video for you. We're gonna be taking a look at this original Perry blunderbuss from the late 1700s. Earlier this week, I was on Founder of the Day to talk with Jason, the host, about muzzle loaders and the difference between rifles and muskets as they pertain to the American Revolution. During the conversation, blunderbusses came up, but what Jason didn't know is I was able to get my hands on an original blunderbuss. Now this is a Perry blunderbuss made by William Perry, who was active in Birmingham around 1780. You don't get to see very many of these out in the wild. Um, a blunderbuss is kind of a, a weird redheaded stepchild, I think, of the muzzleloading world. They're super neat, but they're not very common. There's not a lot of people out there making a real traditional, historically accurate blunderbuss. I think a lot of people see them or get their hands on them. It's kind of a one or two off custom builder made. So this is just a, this is really neat to be able to hold this piece of history in my hands. Here's an up close look at the lock. Now, several of these that you'll find online, the engraving on the lock is in much better shape than this one. Um, on this one, just under here, you can barely see the engraving of Perry under the pan there. And there's a little bit of detail around the back here but on this one, it's, it's pretty worn out. Um, along the back here, we have a real traditional London British engraving on this side plate. And you can see it, it's really well worn too. This is not a high quality, uh, necessarily museum grade blunderbuss. This has definitely been used over time. We can see up here towards the muzzle that somewhere along the lines, we've lost a large chunk of the stock here and a brass patch has been added here to kind of replace what I can imagine is a ramrod pipe that went here that got lost at some point. This is stocked in walnut. There's not a whole lot of figure um, but you can see back here in the back there's some nicks and scratches and bumps and along the tang here you can see there it's been beat up a little bit from being shot. There's some cracks in that stock. The really neat thing about this is the spring-loaded bayonet. And I'm going to open up the latch here. I don't know if I can get the full thing on camera, but um, we'll show it to you a couple times because it is pretty quick, especially for how old of a blunderbuss this is. So we have this mechanism here. Now this is kind of our bayonet trigger is what I would call it. And so at this point where the bayonet is sheathed, the tip of the bayonet fits in to this catch assembly and when I pull this back it's going to flick forward in kind of a, an at arms position. So I'm going to hold it down here so we can catch the whole bayonet as it flicks out and there it is. Like most of the bayonets from the time it's three sided so you can stick it in and, and twist it around and make that wound extra nasty to, to, to clean up. The bayonet mechanism, I think, is a really neat example of 18th and 19th century engineering here. It's not something that you really think about being developed and being made, but it, it really shows you the early industrial change across the world that came with muzzleloader manufacturing as we passed the 18th century and got into the 19th century. A mechanism like this, I think, is really indicative of what we see later in muzzleloading and manufacturing processes. And it's it's neat to see it kind of on, um, to see it on this flintlock, which is what we kind of think of as early firearms technology. Not as early as the matchlock and the doglock stuff, but um, it's kind of a, an amalgamation of frontier, like we think of here in the States, with growing industry power over in England. So I'm gonna set the bayonet back in its catch. Over here on this side, you can see we have a little release lever. If I push that in, it releases the bayonet. And I can pull it back and set it in that catch. Now that catch is only holding about an eighth of an inch of that bayonet tip. If that bayonet tip got bent or busted off, um, you'd be a, a really bad state, you wouldn't be able to flick this and set the bayonet back in. It would always be in an always armed position. So let's flick it open here again one more time just so you can see it. Boom. That's pretty nasty, isn't that? I mean, that's just, I mean, Mossberg builds a nice shotgun, but boy, this is a reproduction ramrod in this one. 
This is another ramrod that came with it. Now, I don't know how old this ramrod is in relation to the blunderbuss. I don't think it's the original one, but it could be. So, or it could be modeled off of an original. It's something that's really neat about old muzzleloaders is there's a little bit of mystery with them. And when you have something like this that you know this part is original, um, even down to these repairs are certainly pretty old. It'd just be great if this thing could talk. And, and how did it get here in the States? Was it during the American Revolution? Was it after? Was it, you know, in, this, in the 1970s, you know, when muzzling was really big in the States with the bicentennial? Did it come over then as kind of a collector's item? It'd just be great if it could talk. Well, I'll leave the bayonet out here and show you some of the barrel proof marks that we have. So from the research I've done on these, these were almost always engraved with Perry here on the brass barrel and under the pan here on the lock. On the barrel here, we have two English proof marks. And the research online shows that there are a couple other proof marks probably on the underneath side of this barrel. Now, William Perry was known for his brass barrels. He primarily built, from what I've read, um, these brass barreled blunderbusses and brass barreled pistols. That was just kind of what people knew Perry for at the time. You can see some of the detail here in the trigger guard. We have this nice acorn motif. And this whole trigger guard is engraved, but like I said, the high wear areas on this, the engraving is just about gone. Um, you can see here back at the breech, of the barrel, there's more engraving there too that's just been worn off, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, it's It'd be one thing if this was a perfect piece, but it's kind of neat seeing the dings and the scratches and the butt plates, seeing the wearing on the engraving here where this would be shouldered or maybe fired from the hip, I don't know, kind of Rambo style. We can cock the lock here takes a little bit to get that back. Probably use a little internal cleaning up on this guy, but it's not a match shooter, so we're not too worried about that. It's pretty quick for its age. I mean, I don't know a lot of things that are a couple hundred years old that can move that fast. Here, we'll, we'll do it one more time for you, just so you can see that lock in action. Pretty quick. Pretty quick. You can see here it's got this early safety mechanism, and that would be used to hold the hammer back so you're kind of you're at an always ready position, and if you saw an ambush coming, uh, you could flick that back, disengage that safety, and be ready to go. So to give you some of the technical specs about this, the overall length is 29 and a half inches. The barrel makes up 14 and a quarter inches. The bayonet makes up about 12 and a half inches of that. For the barrel itself, the muzzle diameter here at the very end is about an inch and a quarter wide. Farther down in here, the research I've done shows that it's about a 62 caliber. And we know that a lot of the military muzzleloaders of the day, especially the smoothbore stuff, was around 62 and up into the low 70s as far as caliber goes. So this kind of this really lines up with the other manufacturing we know the British were doing at the time. Here's a final look at this neat piece of muzzleloading history. If you like these videos and want to see us showcasing some more original muzzleloaders, let us know in the comments what you'd like to see. Uh, we have quite a few friends in quite a few places, and it, it's not too hard to dig up something neat. So if you like this blunderbuss, please like and subscribe to the channel. We'll try to have some more with this and some other blunderbuss stuff in the pipe. I know Traditions makes a blunderbuss kit. Some people have expressed some interest in us making on the channel. We're not going to fire this guy um, just yet. We haven't done a lot of, of research on how good the internals are for it. We don't really want to put a, we could probably put a light charge in here, but um, that's a little bit down the road with this, with this old beauty. If you like this video and want to support the channel and the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association and everything that we're doing, head on over to nmlra.org slash join. For as little as $3 a month, you can support what we're doing to preserve muzzleloading history here in the States. And you're going to receive our monthly Muzzle Blast publication. Muzzle Blast is the only monthly muzzleloading and black powder magazine out there. Each month you're going to get 84 pages jam-packed with everything muzzleloading. Whether you're a traditionalist or a modern muzzleloader, Muzzle Blast has what you're looking for. So head on over to nmlra.org slash join and check it out. Thank you.